and 1000 time uh, for Thursday's political panel. Uh, first, the director of the Centre for Labour and Social Studies, Ellie Mayo Hagen. Ellie, welcome to the Jeremy Carr Drive Show. How are you? Hi, I'm well, thanks. How are you? I'm good. Connor Tomlinson, political commentator with Young Voices UK. No doubt I'll be the oldest person in the discussion. Connor, welcome. How are you? Hello again, Jeremy. Happy New Year. And to you both. Uh, let's start with uh, Novak Djokovic. Uh, I just laid my stall out. You failed to meet the entry requirements. I so don't care who you are. Well done, Australia. Ellie, what do you say? I think that we shouldn't be uh, deporting people because they haven't been vaccinated. That strikes me as going down quite a dangerous path. But, you know, I am pleased that this is giving us an opportunity to actually look at um, the immigration system in Australia because um, it's one that our government in the UK has said that they want to copy in many ways. And what we're finding and what Djokovic's fans are finding out now is that it's actually a very cruel and unfair immigration system. So some of the people in the building that Djokovic is staying in have been in a limbo for nearly 10 years. Um, they've been waiting to be told whether they can stay or leave Australia. That's clearly not a system that works. You know, Australia also has um, offshore detention, uh, which has been criticised by so many organisations in Australia. Can, as I being jump in and say, cool. can I jump in and say something? If you believe, right, with respect, that a government's or a country's system of immigration or in fact any part of that country is wrong, fundamentally flawed, don't go there and play in their National Tennis Open and try and win a million dollars. Jovak Nokovic, Djokovic is trying to get... Ra you, you might... Well, I, the point I'm making, Ellie, is whether you disagree or agree with their system, I believe that he thought, because he's the number one tennis player in the world and the biggest draw, that they would let him in the side door. And that fundamentally, surely, is the wrong message to send to everyday Australians and other people who've been locked up for months, that somebody can take their private jet and get round the rule makers. That's what I'm saying, I guess. You know, I couldn't agree with you more about that. I think in the pandemic, we've seen far too much of the wealthiest and most powerful people um, thinking that they can flout the rules and often getting away with it. So I suppose one area where I am pleased is to see the law applied equally in this case. But I think where I disagree is I think the law itself is wrong and it shouldn't be applied to anybody because, as I say, if we're going down the path where we're deporting people because they're not vaccinated, I think that's very dangerous and it's something that we need to avoid. But doesn't a country have a right to say if they want to stop it, we're not having you in unless you can prove you've been vaccinated? Why is that wrong, Connor? Well, it's not a question of legality, of course, because a country has the ability to have the national sovereignty to say, oh, we don't have to let you in for any given reason. We're on here to discuss, is it right to do that? Because, of course, Saudi Arabia has every right, air quotes, to say, oh, women can't drive in our country. But we obviously think that's wrong. So I actually agree with Ellie here. You can't, uh, I don't think Australia should be barring people because of the vaccination status. I think the Australian immigration system has merits in its point-based system in terms of uh, work visas for certain jobs you need to do. But, so but isn't that, isn't, haven't, you the, haven't you just made the, haven't you just made the point but but both of you i'm sure would agree with this and i guess i'd probably come down on the side of both of you but i will say this my issue with Jov jovat whatever his bloody name is um he whatever his name is i don't really care dave um he flew to australia on his private jet and apparently had been allowed to use a medical exemption right under australian law he didn't have the correct exemption. Before we get on our moral high horses and say, you know, the system's wrong, is this not an example of somebody thinking that they're bigger than the law? That's that's my point. Whether that law is something we disagree with, I think Djokovic was trying to buck the system. And I'm actually quite happy that they've stood up to somebody. It'd be very easy to get the number one tennis player in the world. Let's let him in. Don't think that sends a very positive message to your people, does it? In any way. It's fair to say that he was going to try and circumvent the law. We saw this yeah. at the G7, the G20, when they were preaching masks at the Labour Party conference, and they weren't using them. Yeah. So it's fair to say the law should apply to everyone equally for varying wealth status, of course. But again, I'm not comfortable with the law being applied at all. I agree with Ellie, and I don't think it's a fair law. So they shouldn't be, uh, he should be penalised for it. He should be allowed to play tennis, especially because it doesn't make any sense to penalise for vaccination status when was it 91 percent of uh, australia is vaccinated 16 and up and then they're having massive case spikes because they've pursued zero covid it was never going to happen let the man play tennis interesting cost of living crisis ellie um mm. this is on the the tip of everybody's tongue as we head into 2022 we're there already aren't we i can't believe that um 
it, it, it's an interesting um, concept. Everybody seems hung up on political sleaze and Boris Johnson and the, the green agenda. But the cost of living crisis looms. And Peter Carbill said earlier, will be the real hot political potato in the next 18 months. Do you agree? Absolutely. I mean, what we're seeing in terms of energy bills is incredibly worrying. You know, a, a story yesterday said that um, some people's energy bills uh, might increase by 46 percent this year which I just think is absolutely unsustainable for the majority of families. And I think something has gone really wrong with our energy supply system. There's and no actually, doubt, there's a, I was asking Peter earlier, there's no doubt there's problems with uh, the energy supply system. There's no, no, there's no doubt that the cost of, of, of fuel has gone up, both gas and electricity. What about this, this quest for zero emissions and Boris Johnson, who used to be blue and is in the red and has now gone green? Many Tory voters would say, and I quote, uh, he needs to get his head out of his green backside and concentrate on other things that matter. They didn't elect him for that. Do you think if he steps back from that, that obsession he seems to have gained over the last few months, do you think that would make a difference to the cost of energy bills, for example? Well, I think the research shows that actually renewable energies will uh, reduce people's bills um, because oh, there's, no. there's, uh, there's more energy available. And I think, you know... Um, when it comes to uh, tackling the climate crisis, I think there is actually no other urgent um, issue. There's no issue that is as urgent yeah, as but this. Ellie, 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 you know, Ellie, a majority of people It's not something that this, we can afford I, to, I, turn, I, to I completely agree with you, but the majority of the people in this country don't care. They don't actually think like that. They want to I pay just, their mortgages no, and put food on their true. table. They do. I think what you what you see when you look at, um, when you when people are asked this question is you can see that climate change goes further and further up the agenda every year. And that's because it does affect ordinary people. It I'm not, I'm not people saying it doesn't, but I'm wondering um, in, in a world that becomes harder and harder, being genuine here, harder and harder to make ends meet and, and do everything that we need to do. Connor, let me ask you as well. Is it at the forefront of people's minds or is it not something that Boris probably decided he should attack and has come to the realisation that it's too difficult, costs too much and he doesn't please enough people. That's what I think will happen, but that's just my opinion. What's yours? No, you're dead on. The cost of living crisis has been exacerbated by bad government policy. Now, I think Ellie and I both agree that net zero is a great idea for national security reasons, I? like get us off buying oil from Russia, get us off buying batteries from China, for example. We can source all of our energy ethically. Now, is that going to happen with renewables? Ellie's absolutely wrong to say that it would be cheaper to do renewables for energy bills, because I've actually done some research on this. If all of Britain tried to go renewable overnight, it would take all of the batteries in the world from now till 2028 to do it. So that would be no electric cars, no other countries around the world doing renewables, etc. Cost three trillion, and it would only make 27% of all of our energy demands, and it wouldn't be able to be protected from blackouts. So it's a terrible, economically suicidal idea that will leave people colder and poorer. So it's a, so also, it's is awful. your so, solution then? Let me just clarify mm -hmm. then. Is your solution then that we continue to use fossil fuels and that we end up in a world where even the people in the Australian military have suggested that? Mm -hmm. Society itself might not be able to withstand the temperature rises because of the massive disruptive effects it will have on our lives. You know, where millions of people are dying in of floods and heat waves every year, including people in this country. Are you saying that we should do that instead? Would you want me to answer the question? Because or I not? think, okay, I um, think let, me, let me finish my point. I you've, think you've had, you've had we, quite a lot of time. Let me finish my point, on. please. I think when we talk about this issue, we often talk about it as though we have a choice in massive change occurring in our society in the next 10 years. And we don't have a choice about that. Massive change is going to occur in our and lives. And you've already said century. this, you asked me a question. And the, only or and the only choice we have is what kind of change that is. Is it a better world for our children? Can I, can I jump in? Can I, can I, can I jump is in? It a brown Hello? Please, Jeremy. Do can, I uh, can, I, can I jump in? Have. Can I jump in if I can, just yes. very quickly? Uh, and, and, and I never ever saw myself as somebody who was a fence sitter because I'm not French, but I will say this to both of you. I absolutely understand, Ellie Mayo Hagen, that, that, that there should be a responsibility. If you listen to what Connor said at the beginning, he, like you and I, would agree that in an ideal world, this is what people like you won't answer, and I'd love to put this to you, okay? I agree that that is in an ideal world what should happen. The fact is, whether intellectuals and political commentators like it or not, the 
everyday person that listens to shows like this or watches television or watches you two, I'm afraid whether you like it or not, Ellie, doesn't give a damn right now about that. A majority of people care about their mortgages, their kids' education, having an operation, going on holiday, getting over Omicron or COVID, voting in a new government and paying for every other goddamn thing that seems to land in their lap. And I'm not decrying the importance of it. But what I always want to say is sometimes the ideal is not achievable. And it's the people out there who vote for the government and it's the people out there who aren't interested in claptrap. They're interested in everyday things. I agree with you, it should happen, but it's not going to. And I'll bet you any money that Boris Johnson steps back from it this year, not just because of the haircut and the new tie, but maybe somebody's got into his brain over Christmas and said, you need to start listening to the people that voted you in, Boris. And they don't. They might care or think that they care. But they're not bothered about 50 years time. They're bothered about paying their rent at the end of the month, Ellie. That's a fact. I, th I completely agree with you that we need to deal in reality as it is. And I think that the reality is that most people's lives will be affected quite seriously by climate change mm -hmm. in the coming decades. Mm -hmm. And actually, there are policymakers at the moment, um, you know, if you look at organisations like Green New Deal UK, that are putting oh, forward socialist. ways of tackling the climate crisis that create good jobs for people that make housing can i move on can i move on to one final thing because this is you're gonna love this ellie mayo hagen and you're gonna love this connor uh, you've got a minute each uh, tory mp angel rossendale tory mp took to the commons to today to demand that the bbc play the national anthem every night before it switches to bbc news 24 the tory mp for romford said i know that the minister will agree that the singing of the national anthem is something that provides a greater sense of unity and pride in our nation and so in this year of the queen's platinum jubilee will the minister nadine doris take steps to encourage public broadcasters to play the national anthem and ensure that the bbc restores it at the end of the day's program before it switches culture section and Dean Doris replied, fantastic question. Connor Tomlinson, one minute. Go for it. Uh, I don't see how you can object to this, considering the BBC is a state broadcaster. It should pay deference to the country that it owes its, uh, and the people that it owes its, its, its existence to. I think the only kind of people that can object to this sort of thing are people that dislike the country and feel ashamed of our history or somewhat. Gary Lineker trying to say that it's somehow North Koreans play the national anthem. No, Gary, it'd be North Koreans play the national anthem in North Korea, because we don't have the same values. Go and We're live in North Korea then, Gary exactly. Lineker, and stop slagging off the system that pays you so much money. You're like Lewis Hamilton. You do my head in. Ellie May O'Hagan, national anthem or not? I just think it's a silly distraction uh, from the issues that really matter to this people of this country. You mean paying their rent and paying about. their mortgages? Yeah, of course, those issues really do. And let me be clear that because I care about climate change, it doesn't mean that I don't recognise that those things matter to people. I think both things matter. And I think that we as a society are capable of addressing both. And I think that that's what we need to be talking about uh, and not the national anthem. I, I by the way, can I just mention that I'm Welsh and we have our own national anthem. And if they wanted to play that on the BBC every night, I would be very happy. Ah, the Welsh. Were you happy with what Mark Drakeford did over New Year? Uh, I don't know what you're referring to. You couldn't celebrate New Year in Wales, but you could. You had to, you know, Mark Drakeford brought in all those restrictions. Were you happy with that? Oh, God, I think if we, we got talking about that, we would... Uh, I don't think Mark Drake would want the national anthem play. But listen, I love you two. Fantastic. Ellie Mayo-Hagan, Connor Thomason, thank you very much indeed. Today's political panel, it's...